medical center director contacted our 24-7 duty phone number and indicated that the facility had reviewed multiple instances going back to January of 2018 and had identified inpatients who had suffered severe low blood sugar, all of which, with the exception of one, uh, had passed away shortly thereafter. The victims in this case were all elderly males. They all had various health conditions. However, the clinical expectation was that they were all supposed to be discharged. Death did not appear to be imminent. Some of the medical doctors found it unusual, first of all, that there were multiple non-diabetic patients that were dying of these severely low blood sugars. There was no logical reason why their blood sugar plummeted to such dangerously low levels. Within a day of opening their investigation, they contacted the local FBI office, and we got involved. Through time cards, work schedules, and other records, that helped narrow down the possible list of subjects or suspects that could be involved in the case. It quickly became apparent there were a total of four individuals at the hospital out of 1,200 employees who were there at each of the dates um, for these events. Rita Mays was an uncertified nursing assistant who worked in the medical surgical unit that they referred to as Ward 3A. She was responsible for taking the vitals of patients, intake and outtake, as well as taking glucometer or finger stick readings of blood sugar levels of patients. Uh, it is uh, 8.17 p.m. Special Agent Earl Gilliam here with Miss Janice. Rita Mays. What's your title? I'm a uh, nurse's aide. In the initial interview, you really just want her to do as much talking as possible so then go back later and impeach the information that she gave us. Our team was directly across the hall to just listen in. We were putting the pieces together to see what we could make of, of what she had to say. Are uh, you ever administer insulin to patients? No. Not at all? No. The aides are not to give any type of meds. And what about the med room? Do you go to the med room where to keep the medications? The only time <coughs> that I've the... gone in there is when I've been with a, um, with a nurse. She denied being in the medication room alone, which we knew was contradictory with what witnesses told us previously. And what's important there is that the insulin was stored in the medication room. Some of Rita Mays' coworkers on 3A had various accounts that stuck out to us as far as red flags. Uh, she more or less did not act normal when compared to the rest of her coworkers. There were some instances when she, where she held patients' hands uh, while crying bedside with them as well too, which a lot of the staff indicated to us was was abnormal. I'm not going to find that what you're telling me, I'm not going to find that part of it's not true or all of it's not true. No, sir. I will swear. I will swear to it. Okay, and you I don't will know. swear to it. If, if we had to go to court, I would swear to it. Would you be able to take a polygraph concerning this and pass it? I will not take a polygraph. Why not? Why not? I'm asking. Because I am in, I have a torn ACL and I have constant pain and I wouldn't pass it. Okay. You, you, the pain would make you not pass it? Yes, sir.
we learned that Rita May's husband had been in jail during the times in which the murders took place. Rita Mays' husband would call her almost every morning after her overnight shift ended. Good night. What is it? Oh, yeah. During some of these calls with her husband, Rita indicated her struggles with her interactions with these patients. At 4 o'clock in the morning, I had to take over sitting one of the one-on-ones, and the one I was sitting with, I wanted to freaking strangle. What? I couldn't keep him in bed. They had given him Haldol, and that didn't work, so they gave him two shots of Haldol, and he still was wound up. When she returned the following shift after having placed that call and made those comments, the same patient suffered uh, low blood sugars again, indicative of this patient being administered insulin two different occasions. We had a special agent from the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit come out. They offered for Special Agent Carrie Robbins to participate and to conduct the interview. We had been prepping her for it, just one interviewer in the room. My understanding is, did you win the nurse the year award? Uh, the year before last, nurse's aid. Yeah, and I've heard that. And I've heard that you're the go-to person. You do exemplary work. The interviewer does pay compliments to Mays that would really allow Mays to agree with her and engage her in talking. It builds a little bit of rapport, but it also makes Rita feel that she has the power in the conversation. You can see she's hunched her shoulders and, and drawn her arms across her body as um, pretty defensive. So to me, I think she was panicking a little bit. I think with lawyer, you sit me up. From here on out, I need a lawyer.
right after the interview, there was a major payoff because uh, within a few hours of that end of the second interview, she actually buys a book called I'm Dead, Now What? Indicating that she's having potentially some suicidal thoughts. Why? Because she's just been told she is the prime suspect in all of these cases. It almost gave us more fuel to figure this out. We're gonna get to the bottom of this. Between the second interview in August of 2018 and October of 2019, uh, the bulk of the investigative work was complete during that time period. The investigation involved a review of hundreds of thousands of VA employee emails, years worth of internet browsing activity, a review of hundreds of hours of recorded phone calls, a review of other electronic media and electronic evidence as well. What we learned at that point in the investigation was that uh, Rita would talk with other staff members on Facebook Messenger, and they would, in real time, uh, be discussing patients and what was going on on the ward. And Rita was referring to some of our victims. What happened to this patient who was in this room? And what about this patient? So she was following up to see, essentially, did they live or did they die? The interviews were important despite not obtaining a confession. There was no eyewitness, no surveillance camera footage, no murder weapon, no DNA, no fingerprint. Therefore, the culmination of the interviews strengthened the investigation. Although we did not get the verbal answers and, and the confessions that we were looking for, just to be able to tap into the mindset of Rita was just as important. Office emergency. It's Emerald Sands. And my manager said to call you. I had a desk call me and tell me that they heard multiple gunshots coming from a room. Seconds. So I went down there and all I did was put the key in the door, open the door, and everything's covered in blood. Billy Boyette and Alicia Greer started dating around Thanksgiving of 2016. Billy Boyette was violent toward Alicia quite often, choked her, kicked her in the face. She just needed a place to get away and hide from him until that could happen. Jacqueline was actively trying to help her hide from Billy Boyette, and that's why she was at the motel that day. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, trying to help Alicia in any way that she could. According to Mary Rice's mother, who had the children that belonged to Mary Rice, she had not heard from Mary, which was not normal for her. She was a mother of three. She was doing the best she could as a single mother, worked at a local Dollar General to try to make ends meet. Based upon the statements that were made by the family of Mary Rice, they were concerned about her safety because she would not have abandoned her children. We were alerted about how Billy was known to hang out within Mary Rice's area. So there is a good possibility that Billy Boyette is involved. We now have a manhunt on for Billy Boyette. Through their investigation and talking to witnesses, we found evidence they did have a relationship. Mary Rice's brother was incarcerated with Billy Boyette. 
witnesses told us that he introduced her to Billy Boyette and they wrote letters back and forth numerous times. Then Billy got out of prison and they were kind of known to be together somewhat. We obtained a search warrant and managed to get numerous phone messages between Mary Rice and Billy Boyette on the day those murders occurred. Reading her text and reading his text back and forth, we were able to put two and two together that Mary Rice knew of the problems that he was having with Alicia Greer. Investigators made the determination that she's a willing participant, not a victim. In the early morning hours, we were notified of another homicide in Baldwin County, just across the state line there in Lillian, Alabama. A lady named Peggy Bros was found deceased in her own driveway. It appeared that the suspect had shot her in the face in her front yard, then took her keys and her vehicle, which was a white Chrysler Concorde. She had been shot with a 38 revolver, the same type of handgun that was used in the homicides of Alicia Greer and Jacqueline Moore. Also, based upon witnesses, the suspect's physical description met that of Billy Boyette. A female by the name of Kayla Crocker was located by her mother, bound in rope. Kayla was shot in the head with a pistol, and there was actually blood splatter and blood spray on the crib from her being shot. Kayla Crocker had been killed and her car taken. They seemed to have no qualms at all about killing somebody and taking their vehicle. Mary Rice had used her ID to check into that hotel. Georgia State Police surrounded the entire motel. Their SWAT team arrived. There was nowhere for them to go. We pretty much figured it was going to be a shootout. They eventually make contact with Mary Rice, telling her that she needs to surrender, come out with her hands up, which she does. Georgia State Police SWAT makes entry. As soon as they make entry, Billy Boyette commits suicide with a gunshot wound to the head. Before we started our interview, Mary Rice was making allegations. She was being held against her will by Billy Boyette and that she had been sexually assaulted. Ultimately, that she was, in fact, a victim, not a willing participant. Is he the monster? He's serious about everything he says. He was going to kill me if I didn't do what he said. Only my God's grace am I sitting here today. Take a deep breath, Mary. You're all right now. Just take a deep breath. To your knowledge, did the thing, the incident at the Emerald Sands Inn, did that happen before he picked you up? Yes. Yes. To my knowledge. All right, where, where did you go from there? We were riding, and he made me go into a, a small market. Did he stay out in the car? No. He, um, he, was, in, he was in Walmart. Okay. He was watching me, and I know he could see me in the store. What did you get at Walmart? Um, ammunition. Ammunition 38, 38. She doesn't know. We have the video from Walmart, and we did see that Billy's sitting in the car outside on camera. So we can see he stays there in the vehicle the entire time. And she's in Walmart on camera shopping like there's nothing going on. We tracked her all throughout the store with the interior cameras. She claims that he told her if she made any notifications to anybody, or told anybody that he would kill her and kill her children as well. But she's in there by herself. Never did she make any type of notification, ask for help or assistance or anything. She was lying to us. What happens then? I don't know. He comes back with white heart. 
So he goes off with a dark SUV and comes back with a white car? Yes, yes. He has somebody with him. They have a gun on me, they're in the back. I didn't even get a good glimpse of who they were or anything. As I had to get in the car and drive the kind of gun to my side. I had to follow him to a parking area. When you got into the car to drive, you got a person holding a gun to you, correct? Yes. Where did the, the other, this other guy you're talking oh, about, no, where did he I come from? I don't know, and I've never seen him after. I, she has no idea that we have video surveillance of Mary Rice behind the wheel of the vehicle alone in the SUV, following Billy in the white car. We know that she's not telling the truth. OK, that's not true. And I'll tell you no, why. It's no, we did. Mary, listen to me. Okay. If I were to tell you that Numerous people saw you and Billy following the person in the white car to her home, where the white car was taken. You were with them because you guys were seen together, OK? There wasn't a third person there. It was just you and Billy, right? Right. OK. Why did you tell me that? Because I'm this scared. Is, well, I understand I'm you're scared. scared. The truth makes more sense than the story yes, at this point, does. you know what I that's mean? That's the truth. OK, OK. Well, thank and you. that's the only thing that I embellished on. OK, thank you for being honest. But I'm scared. I know you are. <laughs> she knew she was caught, had said enough, and then emotions come flooding in. It was a collective agreement between all of us that she was at the point that she was about to shut down. We just chose at that time to abruptly end the interview. I mean, it's cut and dry and clear as it could be. We had enough that we had a signed arrest warrant by a judge to charge her with murder. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Mary Rice is as guilty as Billy Boyette. She had a choice, and she chose to follow Billy Boyette. And she is paying the price for her actions. We will never understand why things happened the way they did. The thing we have to understand is there's evil in this world. Santa Fe Street near the railroad tracks in East Dallas. We find a strangled Hispanic female there who's had her clothes torn off of her. They swabbed her. And all of the swabs tested positive for the presence of seminal fluids. was on a dead body that was found at a construction site. She was hidden behind mounds of dirt that were there. She also was left partially nude. After the DNA results came in, that confirmed it. This is the same killer. Six months passed, a year passed, and this individual did not strike. Was he going to hit again? I felt that he would, and uh, it was just a matter of time. The victim was found at a garage. She's displayed on the hood of a car after having been brutalized by someone. She's completely naked. The victim's name was Veronica Hernandez. There it was. We realized that he was still out there. We were looking at the same individual. There's no doubt in our mind. 
the media made it run like wildfire and an anonymous caller called in a tip that this particular suspect that he had seen with the stirred victim was actually wearing a mechanic shirt. And on the shirt, he had his name, Jose. And sure enough, there was an individual in that shop named Jose where the body was found. And that's how we ended up with Jose Cifuentes on our radar. Jose Cifuentes, he was a 21 year old. I think I was 26, maybe 25. I mean, we were not far off. He said he was from Mexico. I'm like, hey, I was born in Mexico. It kind of breaks the, the tension. And there's something that connects us. He told me this sob story that, man, I wouldn't hurt a fly. I would never kill a chicken. It was that cat and mouse, you know, game, see how much you know. And I said, you know what? I know you took her. He finally told me that he took her to that shop. He said, she fought. And he said, I silenced her. I went and told the lead detective, hey, this guy just confessed. The problem was that after Cifuentes had been jailed, he turned around and made bond. At that time, the bond was set at 100,000. To me, it's, it's kind of low. All you have to do is post 10%. So his sister posted the bond. I inappropriately assumed I had the luxury of time. So we go back to an investigative mode and we're looking for the guy. His sister tells us he's fled back to Mexico. We spent a lot of time looking for him, but not finding him. And then here, years later, homicide detectives think they have found uh, this guy, Jose Cifuentes, on Facebook. Uh, he created a Facebook page. It seemed implausible, but it was the truth. FBI and Interpol and the folks down in Mexico City put together a, a surveillance team. He was arrested on, uh, I'll never forget it, April 25th, 2019. <laughs> It's been two decades, and if we can put a familiar person in front of him, he's more likely to divulge information. Jose? Si. ¿Cómo estás? Bien. ¿Te acuerdas de mí? Si. You have to gain their trust, and one of the best ways is see if you can give him something. And I gave him the picture of his wife. Te hago una foto. It usually builds report. ¿Cómo consiguió esta foto, Lee? Leak. That is the short term for licenciado in Spanish. A licenciado, it's somebody with a title. So it was like, uh, you know, I respect you. The reaction to the, the photo of his wife was instant. It was like, from the minute he walked into the room, Juan Salas, he reached into Cifuentes and just grabbed his soul and like broke it open.
It wasn't a question, it was more an affirmation. How many have you killed? I want him to know that I already know the answer. Pero yo quiero hablar del 98. Ah, sí, una chava de la... No, pues esa yo la salió de un bar y la seguí. Ok. Yeah. Y ya, pues, le pedí que tuviéramos relaciones y pues sí dijo que sí, ¿verdad? Ah, uh, ok. ¿Tuviste ahí relaciones? Ajá. ¿Y qué pasó? Ya después como que... Ah, pues yo le dije que le iba a pagar y le dio coraje que no, ¿verdad? Ok. Y entonces empezamos a, a discutirle, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. La agarré de aquí del cuello, ¿verdad? Ok. Y pues la apreté ¿verdad? hasta que se asfixió. Y ya después como que pasó eso, me asusté, pues agarré el carro y me... So, tú más o menos en tu mente sí sabías que estaba muerto. Sí, sí, sabía. I remember the day, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. You work on something that long and to have it culminate in that way is a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. Okay. Después, después de esta, pasó otra vez. Ajá, otra vez. Era de mesera. ¿Y qué pasó esa noche? Igual y pues hice lo mismo que con ella, ¿verdad? El coraje. Me arrepiento por todo lo que ha hecho. Le, le pido perdón a Dios. Sí. Usted se fue antes y killed three people. And he confessed to it. That's the icing on the cake. Because I knew that he was facing minimum three life sentences. He's not coming now. Hernandez's daughter gets on the stand and looks at him and her eyes kind of explode and she points at him and she says I remember you you were at my mother's funeral he has been there in the last of the bancas of the funeral o sea algo que te quita tu mamá todo el tiempo vas a tenerlo ahí eso nunca se te borra de la mente <laughs> 